the record now. And welcome everybody to Must Learn Thursday. Tonight it's all about fats with Dr. Carpenter. And uh, we're turning it over to you. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise and passion um, for our fat friends. Thank you for having me and good evening, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so you can see the presentation. Okay. Let's see. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Awesome. All right, so this is actually a picture that I took uh, several years ago in December at uh, Gwyn's Falls Leakin Park in Winans Meadow. And that is a red bed that came out um, on a warm winter day and decided to forage in the early afternoon. And I'll talk a bit more about red bats and why they're super cool. And we definitely have a bunch of them there. Um, a general outline for this evening's presentation. First, I'm gonna talk about some of the benefits that bats provide us, sometimes in ways that we don't normally think of. And then I'll shift and talk about my past research with bats in Baltimore and some of the results that I found. And then I'll go a little bit more in depth about some of those bat species that live in this area. And then I will end by talking about some of the threats that are facing bats and how we can support them. I saw lots of folks were interested in learning more about bat houses. So I'll definitely be sharing some bat house resources uh, at the end of the talk. So in the past, when I've done these talks, I usually have to start with like dispelling the myths, but I'm assuming everyone here kind of knows a lot of those myths about bats aren't true. Um, a small amount get rabies, they don't fly in your hair. There's been no documented uh, evidence that they are the ones that caused um, COVID-19. So I'm gonna focus on all the benefits. Um, and one that a lot of us already know is about the bat city insects. And there was a study done by the USGS uh, many years ago, and they wanted to estimate the financial benefit of bats. So they calculated that at least in the US that bats save us over $3.7 billion a year in pest management services. So that includes things like when we would be spraying pesticides on things that includes the financial cost of damage to crops and things like that. So that's one that a lot of us know about because all the bats that live around us eat insects. In other parts of the world, they also provide benefits that impact us here as well. Another group is the nectar eating bats. And just like we know bees are pollinators, there are lots of bats that also provide pollination services for a lot of the fruits and things that we use as well. The last group are fruit eating bats and they play what I call this role called the gardeners of the rainforest. And they do that by doing seed dispersal. And so basically they will be eating fruit, they'll end up eating some of the seeds or they may just pick up the whole fruit and carry it somewhere else. And then that seed gets dropped um, further away and they end up helping plant seeds um, for different trees in the rainforest, which is wonderful, I think. And so the next few slides, I'm just gonna list some examples of, oops, some examples of things that bats have been documented eating or their connections to us. And so um, I think maybe I'll use the, there's a little emotion reaction at the bottom. So um, if you see something on this list that you eat or use, um, put like a thumbs up or some sort of emoji or just comment on one of these things that you notice that has a direct impact on you. And I think that should probably be all of us if we're all wearing some sort of cotton garment. Um, one of the things that bats have been found to eat are cotton bowl worms. So all these different pests have been documented being eaten by bats. And so we can thank them for that. So the second group I talked about were bats that tend to eat nectar or pollen. Uh, this background picture shows how well they do the pollination act. You can see all the pollen just covered all over the bat's little face and on its wings. And then it'll fly to another flower and continue in the pollination process. And you can see some examples here of different things that a lot of these uh, nectivorous bats have been documented um, pollinating or visiting the flowers of. And I'm sure folks definitely see some examples of things there that they use. Um, a common thing that I like to share with folks is that with agave in the Southwest United States and in Mexico, 
those are only pollinated by bats. So the thing that we get tequila from is only made possible by bats pollinating these agave plants and helping produce these plants that we eventually use for agave syrup and tequila and things like that. And then this slide shows some of the different things that bats have been documented dispersing the seeds of. Uh, there are a lot of other examples from within these different plant families on the right. And I didn't wanna document all of them because they're not, I wasn't familiar with a lot of them. So I just kind of pulled examples of ones that we are a bit more familiar with. Um, another example that I didn't put on here uh, that I think bats both disperse the seeds of and help pollinate are the wild relatives of the banana plant. So the bananas we eat now don't have seeds in it, but they're wild relatives that they came from. Those are affected by bats as well. And so now I'm gonna shift and talk a little bit about my past research with bats here in Baltimore. This background picture is a vacant lot in Northeast Baltimore. I think it's off of Lock Raven or Homewood, I'm not sure. Um, but it's not too far from City High School. And this was one of my research sites. And you might see in this upper right corner, a little brown device. And I will talk about what that is and how I use that to study bats. And so a lot of times when I started doing this work, people were wondering why did I decide to focus on bats and why did I decide to do this here in Baltimore? Um, I initially started out doing urban wildlife research here in the city back in 2013. And I was helping out um, the Baltimore ecosystem study with their ongoing bird monitoring. So I was going around the city doing bird surveys and I was really fascinated by how many different species I had seen just inside of the city. And I, even though I grew up here, I never really thought about Baltimore as any kind of place to study wildlife. Cause I always wanted to go like out of the city, out of the country even to study wildlife. Um, but my experience with BES made me realize how much I enjoyed it. And uh, my past research, I had studied bats for my master's degree. And so for my PhD program, I decided to merge that previous love of bats with my new interest in urban ecology. Um, and as I started looking into research about what had been done in the past in Baltimore, I discovered that there was no past research on bats in the Baltimore area. Um, there have been some studies on the Eastern shore. And of course there's lots of work that's been done um, in the Western counties, kind of where the caves and mines are. And then in DC as well, but there's kind of this research gap in the central Maryland area. And just around the time I was starting this project, uh, the Maryland Department of Natural Resources was updating their species of greatest conservation concern list. And they decided to go ahead and list all the bat species that were known to be in the state in that category of greatest conservation concern. And I started kind of expanding that to look at other bat studies in other urban areas. And there weren't that many because a lot of the urban ecology research tends to focus on the things that are easiest to look for in cities, which are birds and plants and pollinators. So I, saw, I thought it was a great opportunity to kind of fill in this data gap that existed. Mm. And so, as I mentioned, I was looking at uh, studies of bats in other areas to kind of see what things stood out and nothing really stood out. There's a lot of variation in results. And so the impact on bats really depended on whether you were studying one city or multiple cities, it depended on what part of the country you're in, it depended on what species you were looking at. And there are some general benefits of uh, cities to bats and that include um, the presence of roosts like this one in downtown Austin, this is the Congress Avenue bridge. Very beneficial for the Mexican free-tailed bats that like to live there. Um, buildings and bridges oftentimes provide these unique kind of roosts that aren't available in trees and in caves and other natural spaces. Uh, in cities, we also have things like reservoirs and pools and other additional sources of water. And we have, of course, lots of street lights that will attract insects and some bats will take advantage of that. Of course, there are also a lot of not so good things about that. Um, with bats being in these larger colonies in cities, there's a higher chance of them being predated upon by other urban wildlife like raccoons and feral cats and things like that. 
Um, also, when they're in those large congregations, there's also an increased risk of spreading disease to one another. And of course, being in cities with people, there's always going to be the likelihood of human bat conflicts, especially when they move into people's houses and people do not want them there. <laughs> and so for the first part of my research, I just wanted to find out the initial question of what was in the city. I knew that in the state, there was somewhere between 10 and 12 species. Um, but before I could really create a dissertation, I wanted to know what was here first. And so I did that using a uh, technique called active acoustic monitoring. And so I'm sure a lot of you all are familiar that bats use echolocation to locate where the food is, to avoid running into each other, to avoid running into buildings and things like that. These little devices will record their echolocation calls and allow us to determine what species are in the area. So even if we can't see or handle them, we can use these devices to determine what's in the area. And hopefully this video will work. Um, it looks like it's sideways right now, but it'll play right ways in a minute. So, so you can kind of hear it making beeps and boops, and then you can see the little bat that is flying in circles on the edge of the woods there. So you can see there the little blips and what I could do with that later is download it onto a laptop. And these are little time frequency graphs that uh, these devices produce. So time is along this axis, frequency is along here and this is in kilohertz. And our hearing range is at the max around 15 to 20 kilohertz. And you can see most bats produce calls above that and we can't hear it. So these devices are very helpful for us. So when you look at this graph here, you can see there's two different types of calls. And fortunately, for the most part, you can identify different bat species by the different size and shape calls. So you see one set of calls here that are very steep. They drop down to about 25 kilohertz. And just from past research, we know that those calls come from big brown bats, which are a very common urban species. You can also see another set of calls that are a bit shallower around 18 to 20 kilohertz. And we know from past research that those calls come from hoary bats, which are a much less common species of bat. And so I spent that first summer um, of my research program um, doing this kind of pilot study in several areas. And these are the results from that little pilot study. So I visited four vacant lots and then I visited um, eight parks in the city because at that point I wasn't sure if I wanted to focus on vacant lots or just focus on working in parks. And so the first four that you see here are vacant lots and the rest are parks. And you may recognize some of the names here. So like this one here is Canton Waterfront Park, um, Carroll Park, Patterson Park, Druid Hill, Herring Run, Leakin Park. Hmm. Um, and some of them definitely have a lot. You can see there's tons of bat activity at Lincoln Park. But what I thought was interesting was that a couple of these vacant lots, actually, they're very small, but they had similar levels of recordings to places like Carroll Park and Patterson Park, which are much bigger um, mm. than these little vacant lots. And so I was very intrigued by that. And then these are, of course, the pictures of the different species um, at the top. And another quick thing before I forget, um, the thing that we do with this data is we can determine how active bats are. We can't determine how many individuals there are. So we can't determine like population or um, biodiversity in that manner because there's no way to know if um, one bat is flying by the detector five times or if it's five individuals that are passing by the detector once. And so that was what I did uh, for the first part of my research. During the second part, I wanted to actually look at why these bat species might be here in the city. So what kind of variables are associated with them being here? Is it trees? Is it water? Is there, are there certain human variables? Um, and so as I mentioned before, a lot of times in urban ecology studies, people tend to do research in parks, which makes sense. They're big. They're pretty easy to access. Um, not much has been done with vacant lots, though. And for those of you who live in the city, I'm sure you're very familiar with what vacant lots are. And these are just some different examples here 
um, showing the types of variety that's present in vacant lots. A lot of times these are land parcels that don't have any development on it, or they may have had development in the past. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the amount of vacant houses that are present in Baltimore City and how some of those over time start falling apart, falling into disrepair, and then the city will kind of knock them down, um, basically bury it in the ground, cover it up with soil, put some grass seed on it, and then that's a vacant lot. And so I was curious about these smaller green spaces and whether or not bats were using them. And if they are using them, what was special about those vacant lots? And so with this part of the research, instead of using active acoustic monitoring, I used passive. And you can see this little brown box here. And it did the same thing as the previous video I showed you. But instead of me having to stand there and hold it, I can actually just tie it to a tree program it to turn on at sunset and turn it off at sunrise. And it'll record the entire night for me. So I don't have to stand there all night with a detector, which is not the best idea to do in many parts of the city. And so these little devices are called Anabat Express Bat Detectors. And so I was able to tie them to trees. Um, I would leave them there for three nights in a row. And then afterwards I would download all the calls and uh, manually identify them. And so I did that for, let's see. Oh, good, I put the map here. Um, so I had 32 sites in all in the city. And this kind of shows the distribution of some of those places. And it also shows where a lot of these vacant lots are located in the city. And you might see one that's near your neighborhood or near some place you recognize. And so there was a total of nine nights recorded at each of these 32 sites for over two years. And for the other half of that equation, so figuring out what was it about these vacant lots that might you know, suggest why more species or more activity was there, I measured a set of natural variables as well. So when I went to these vacant lots, I would estimate the amount of canopy cover from trees, um, measure how tall the grass or the vegetation was, how tall was the tallest tree, and then also count the number of street lights around each site. Some of you are probably also familiar with GIS or ArcMap, um, kind of using digital mapping to also get more information. And so with GIS, I was able to look at the surroundings around these vacant lots and calculate the amount of green space around these sites, uh, larger scale canopy cover, also looking at things like how many roads were around these vacant lots, um, how many other vacant buildings were present, and then how far these sites were away from the middle of the city and how far away they were from water bodies. And because this is urban ecology and urban wildlife biology, a very important aspect of that is also including uh, human-based measurements into data. Um, we impact the urban landscape and in turn that's gonna impact wildlife. So we also, include information from the census track. Um, this can include you know, our cultural backgrounds, how much money we make, our level of education, um, our family structure and how our neighborhood is kind of structured. And so in order to get that data, I basically went to the 2010 census data that was online and then also the 2017, I think it's called the All Community Survey, which is also done by the US Census. Um, and I looked at where these vacant lots were located and determined what census track or what census block group they were located in. And from that, I was able to find like how much vacant housing was in those tracks, how much rental housing, income, um, the amount of houses that were really old versus newly built, um, high school education level, um, for family structure, I looked at female householders with children, and then for ethnicity or race, I looked at the percentage of those tracks that were Black. And so now I'll share a couple of the results that I found. So overall, I recorded over 33,000 sequences, and I had to manually identify every single one, which was fun. <laughs> um, lots of staring at a computer. Lots of uh, typing, but kind of similar to my previous results, I found the same six species. Um, 
Big brown bats, as I mentioned before, are very common bat species. They were present at all 32 sites. And the, that was followed by red bats, evening bats, and silver-haired bats. Now, hoary bats were present at about 19 of those sites, but I only had maybe a handful of recordings at each of those sites. And the least amount of activity I heard was from the tricolor bat, and I had one call from that species at two sites. So because of the lack of data from these two species, I couldn't do any further analysis on those two species, unfortunately. So when it comes to the analysis for this, um, I didn't really mention any statistics in here, but of course, um, I did several types of statistical programs, a process called ordination, where you can actually analyze multiple variables at once to see if certain ones are correlated with each other or correlated with other bat species. And then I do statistical modeling to see what combination of variables best explains um, the amount of activity from different species. And so that's what these results on the right show. These show the most important variables that seem to best explain the amount of bad activity at sites. And so one that you'll see that's pretty common is distance to water, which makes sense. All species need water. Um, sites that are closer to water tended to have more bad activity. Another important variable for a lot of these species was canopy cover. For some of them, it was the canopy cover that was at that specific vacant lot. And for others, it was the amount of surrounding canopy cover. Um, green space basically just means the amount of forested area around as well. Um, for some, canopy height was important. And so taller trees sometimes means that those are older trees or for some species, they prefer to forage along the edges of trees. And so the presence of trees makes sense that they would be in those areas. Um, for a couple of the species, road density was another variable. And this doesn't always mean like all these factors listed. It doesn't mean that they preferred more of them. For some of these species, they actually preferred less. And so one of those that um, that's an example for is the red bat where um, they preferred lower road density. And I think for a couple of these other species, they didn't prefer a lot of canopy cover, but the presence or absence of it was an important variable for them. So then we also talk about the human or socioeconomic variables that we talked about. Um, one variable that was important for a couple of these species was the amount of vacant housing that was present within that census track or that census block group. Um, one of the things that I think that might be due to is that especially species like big brown bats will roost in buildings. And so if there are more vacant buildings around, <clears throat> um, that may be a potential roost area for them. So we may be documenting them like as they're heading out of their roost. Another thing to think about with uh, vacant housing is a lot of times that means that there's also unmanaged lawns and trees and things like that around. So they may have a lot of vegetation or trees that aren't being, you know, mowed or pruned or things like that. And there may be more insects present in those areas. Another variable that was important for some species was the, or was associated with uh, more bat activity was the median household income. And in urban ecology, there is a phenomenon called the luxury effect, um, where some studies have documented this and some haven't, but a lot of times um, areas that have higher income tend to have more biodiversity or more species present. And that kind of makes sense if you think about um, some of the wealthier parts of the city, for example, they have very large lawns, they tend to get uh, landscaped and manicured and so if you have money to spend on things like that, and you can spend money on buying extra plants and planting trees and spending as much money as you want on bird feeders and bird houses and things like that, it certainly uh, is feasible that income will have a uh, effect on what kind of species are around you. A uh, couple of species had, well, one had a positive association with the amount of um, African-American residents that were in that track. And then I think with the red bat, it was the opposite. Um, 
Another variable that was important for some species was the amount of housing that was over 80 years old. And I'm not quite sure what that association might be. Um, I know in some areas, older neighborhoods will also have older trees as well. But then there are also some neighborhoods in Baltimore where there are very old houses and old neighborhoods, but the trees have been cut down. So I'm not quite sure um, what that result and then also the African-American result really mean. So I've been talking about data and analysis and all this stuff, but um, I wanted to talk a bit more about the actual species and kind of highlight each of them since I haven't had a chance to really talk about them yet. Um, so the one that I've talked about before, very common, is the big brown bat. They are found throughout North America and Central America as well. Uh, they will roost in kind of moderately sized colonies, um, hundreds at the most maybe. One of the reasons that the species is found everywhere is because it's what we call a diet and habitat generalist. That means it's not very picky. They will roost in trees, they will roost in buildings, they'll roost in bridges. Any place that they can figure out to roost, um, they will roost there. And the same when it comes to their diet, um, they will eat all kinds of insects and they're not very picky. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, the picture that I had on that uh, title screen was a red bat. And they're very different from big brown bats, even though they're also pretty common. Uh, instead of roosting in groups, they tend to roost by themselves. You can see in this picture here that that bat is just basically hanging from a little branch. Um, so they tend to roost by themselves. They tend to hang directly from tree branches. And they're kind of a rusty reddish brown color. Um, and what we think that means is that they're kind of camouflaging in the woods. So they look kind of like a dried up, curled up leaf that might be hanging from a tree. And so next time you're out in the woods and you see a dry leaf hanging from a tree, do a double take and make sure that that is actually a leaf and not a red bat. Um, I have a friend who works at the um, Natural History Society, Charlie Davis, and he's told me that at Oregon Ridge, there's a couple of trails where the red bats will hang pretty low um, to the ground in some of the trees and you're actually able to walk by and see them hanging almost at eye level. Another thing that makes these bats uh, pretty unique from other species in the area is that they can give birth to multiple pups or baby bats at a time. Most species will just do maybe one pup a year and that's it, but red bats will often have twins, sometimes even three or four or five bats. Um, Another thing that makes them a bit unique is that they will come out in the late afternoon. So sometimes if you see a bat flying around, probably like around this time, um, it might be a red bat that's just coming out to begin foraging. Uh, they prefer things like moths and beetles and flies. Another thing that I think is really interesting about red bats is that some individuals will migrate just like birds do but some will actually stay in a hibernate. And what they do to hibernate is they will actually drop down to the forest floor and bury themselves under leaf litter and hibernate that way. So the next species we have is the silvered haired bat. And these are also tree roosting bats. They tend to roost inside of trees though. Um, it's interesting that as I was looking up information for some of these species, there's still a lot we don't know about some of these. Um, species in terms of where exactly do they roost. We kind of know in general that they're in older, more mature forests, but they will also migrate as well um, as the red bats do. And you can see they have quite a variety of things that they've been documented eating. Next one is the evening bat. This is one that hasn't had a lot of research done with it specifically. Uh, scientists know that they're migratory, but we actually don't know a lot about how far they go and where they hibernate. Um, and one study that was done a lot of times, let me back up for a minute. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with bird banding that gets done where they have the little bands that get put on their ankles. Um, and that kind of banding happens with bats as well, except it'll go on their forearm right here. 
And so that gives us the same kind of information that it does with birds. It kind of lets us know how old it is and where it was caught. Um, in one of these banded studies, uh, evening bat was banded on its arm and released. And then 547 kilometers south, another study was happening where they caught it and they saw this band on it and they're able to get in touch with the scientists who put the band on and they realized that this bat had migrated over 547 kilometers. And so there's a lot of still missing pieces of information in terms of bat research. We still don't know a lot about how some species migrate. We still haven't documented where certain species hibernate. There's still a lot that uh, we have to discover. This one is probably my favorite bat species that's in the area. It's called the hoary bat. It's one of our largest bats. Um, for most of these species, their weight is maybe around 10 to 12 grams. Um, but you can see with the hoary bat, they're almost double that weight. Um, for a lot of these other species, the wingspan will vary between maybe seven to 10 inches. And hoary bats can have a wingspan of at least a foot. Um, the name comes from an old English term, hoarfrost, which basically just means kind of frosty. And it looks like their fur has been frosted or like they've been dipped in powdered sugar or something like that. Um, if you look at the genus name um, and you notice the genus name of the red bat, you'll notice that they're the same. So they're kind of like cousin species. And just like their cousins, the red bat, they also are solitary and tend to roost directly hanging from trees. They will also migrate just like some of the red bats. And hoary bats are the only bat species that has been documented on Hawaii. And they're actually their own little subspecies. So some time ago, there were some hoary bats that made it all the way to Hawaii, which I think is pretty cool. And then the last bat is the tricolor bat. And it has this name, it recently got its name changed actually. But it has this name because each individual um, blade of hair has three different colors on it. So it's dark gray at the very bottom, it's kind of yellowish in the middle, and then it's a reddish brown at the tip of the hair. Um, I'll talk a bit more about these guys towards the end, but they are threatened for several reasons. Um, they usually hibernate in caves during the winter, but during the summer, they are found in tree roost. But again, it's another one of those kind of mystery areas where we don't know a lot about what kind of trees that they roost in. Now, I didn't document any of these myotis species, but I thought I would bring them up because they were probably historically present here in Baltimore. And I suspect that they may actually still be present in Baltimore. I just didn't document them during my study. Um, I saw several folks in the chat mention little brown bats. A lot of times these bats are associated with kind of aquatic or river areas. Um, they like to eat aquatic insects a lot of times. Um, sometimes they are found in buildings and tree roosts. I didn't document any during my research, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Lights Out Baltimore and they do a lot of uh, bird collision studies downtown where they document what's found. And sometimes they get bats as well. And I was told that they did find a little brown bat downtown. Um, another species of concern is the northern long-eared bat. It's a federally threatened species, and it has been found in, again, forested kind of habitat. Um, I suspect that they might be present here, maybe in some of the larger parks, so like Leakin Park and maybe like Druid Hill or Herring Run, but again, I didn't document any there. Uh, a third species that used to be present in this area, likely, um, is the Indiana bat and that is federally endangered. And just like the tricolor bat, they will roost in trees during the summer and then in the winter, they will go to caves and hibernate there. So next I will talk about threats and uh, conservation. So one of the major threats um, that has been plaguing bats for the past 15 years is a fungal disease called white nose syndrome. Um, it is caused by this fungus, which I will attempt to pronounce as uh, pseudogymnoacus destructans. 
Um, it's believed that this fungus was unintentionally introduced from Europe. Um, they found that bat species there have been, were exposed to this fungus thousands of years ago, possibly, and they developed an immunity to it. Um, and one way or another, those spores were brought from Europe to one cave in upstate New York back in 2006. And this fungus thrives in cold, damp places, which also happens to be where bats hibernate. And what happens is that uh, when these spores get on the bats while they're hibernating, it'll slowly start to spread. The bats will kind of start feeling itchy. They'll come out of hibernation um, you know, to try to groom themselves, to clean it off. But the problem is with hibernation, they have those fat reserves and those fat reserves are usually just enough just to get them through hibernation. So anytime they have to wake up and move around, it's kind of like a battery that they're depleting um, faster than they can replenish it because it's the middle of winter. Um, it also can damage their wings. It can affect their um, behavior. And so a lot of times folks who have documented this will come to these caves during winter and they'll find um, bats flying around during the day, um, landing on snow and trying to eat snow, trying to, you know, get some sort of nutrients in them to make up for the fat that they've lost waking up trying to fight off this disease. And so it ends up resulting in mass mortality. A lot of times anywhere from like 90% of colonies that have been studied in the past have been completely wiped away. Um, as I mentioned, they were first documented at one cave in upstate New York in 2006. Um, as of, I think, two or three days ago, it has now spread to 36 states. It just was documented in New Mexico a few days ago. Um, at least 12 bat species have been documented as having the infection. You can see kind of the white powder on this bat here. So at least 12 bat species have been found with that on it. Um, six other species have been found with spores on it, but they didn't seem to be infected. Um, I do not know if this link is going to work, but I wanted to show. Um, can people see the map that's on the screen? No, it's no. still just your. No. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see if I can stop for one second and share it. It just, I think it's a very interesting um, kind of documenting how far it spreads. So it actually animates it. So you can see, can you see the map now? Yes. Yes, you yeah, can. Okay. So this is a animation that kind of shows the spread of it starting with this one cave in 2007. So as it's going through the different years, you can see how it's gradually um, spreading either through people coming in and out of caves or just bats having the spores on them. And as they leave the hibernation caves, they're moving to other places and possibly getting spores um, on other bats that they encounter. Let's see. Okay, I switched back to the PowerPoint, so hopefully you can see that. Um, I have a slide here just briefly summarizing uh, the impacts of white nose syndrome in Maryland. Um, it's been documented in several counties out in Western Maryland from a lot of the caves and mines that are present out there. Um, you might see some familiar names on here in terms of the species that are affected. So little brown bat has been hit very hard by it. The tricolor bat, which was the one species that I found that had maybe two calls out of the 32 sites, um, as well as the northern long-eared bat, which was already before white nose existed. It was already um, being considered a, a threatened species. And so now white nose has put it even more um, towards the risk of being extinct possibly. Another threat for bats is actually wind turbines. Um, it doesn't have quite the same impact as uh, white nose syndrome, which I think last time I heard a number, they estimated that over 8 million bats had died from white nose syndrome, but 
that was an estimate from several years ago. So I imagine that number is higher now. Um, but in terms of wind turbines, uh, tens of thousands of bats can die from colliding with the rotating turbines. Um, they've documented 12 of the 46 bat species in the US that migrate have been impacted by these. Uh, the good thing is that some wind farm companies uh, are working with biologists and bat conservation groups to reduce the amount of mortality from this. And this can include uh, collaborating on studies looking at the presence of bats before a wind turbine is put up and afterwards to see if they are impacting them. Um, and there's also mitigation and deterrent practices that can be done where um, in certain areas, if they know that bats are going to migrate through at a certain time of year, uh, the wind turbine company can either turn off the blades during that period or they can slow the rotation of the blades down more um, to limit mortality there. Some other um, pretty common threats. Um, the usuals, habitat loss, climate change. There was a massive heat wave in Australia. Um, I think last year, and a lot of the flying fox bats that lived there were impacted by those heat waves. Um, roost disturbance and vandalism is another threat. So when people disturb the trees or the caves that these bats are living in while they're raising the urine or while they're trying to hibernate, um, that can cause uh, impact to them as well. And of course, because a lot of folks don't like them and they have this bad rep, um, some folks may kill bats just due to their uh, fear or ignorance about it, about them when it comes to things like SARS and COVID and rabies. Um, in other countries, some of the larger bat species are part of the bushmeat trade as well. So sometimes they are caught and killed um, for food. And also some uh, fruit and pollinator bat species can be affected by farmers. Um, especially farmers who may own fruit in other countries. They may actually try to hurt the bats to keep them from damaging their fruit. So the most important part, um, talking about what you can do to help bats. Um, there's multiple ways that you can support bats in terms of um, providing habitat for them. Of course, you can see here, bat houses are a very common thing that you can support bats with. Um, you can see this one is a pole mounted one. In general, I've read that bat houses that are mounted on poles tend to be better for bats than bat houses that are mounted on the sides of trees or on the sides of houses. Um, one reason for that is things like raccoons and um, black rat snakes can very easily um, access the sides of trees or the sides of your house. Um, and so putting baffles around the poles, kind of like the baffles that we put around birdhouses that can keep um, predators away. Another important thing for bats is of course insects. And so you can support insect habitat by just planting native plants and vegetation. If you have property where you have trees on it, um, if it's safe to do so and you have kind of dead trees, go ahead and leave those up because bat species will use those as well as other types of wildlife. Um, as long as it's not you know, in danger of falling on somebody. Um, for There are people who own caves and mines and having um, their special type of fencing that you can put up there to limit people from coming in, but will allow bats to come in and out. And if you're someone who likes to visit caves, um, I'm sure a lot of them have been closed now to people exploring, but if you do have access to a cave and you like exploring, um, definitely make sure that you clean your clothes off, anything that you have with you. Um, there's a white nose syndrome website that lists uh, de decontamination protocol that um, can show you how to thoroughly clean your cave equipment and your clothes and all that to make sure you're not unintentionally passing those, um, taking those spores from one cave to another. Uh, hopefully you all have learned some things this evening. Another thing you can always do to help bats is just sharing what you know with others and letting people know that, hey, your coffee or the cotton in your clothes, that's made possible partially by bats just eating insects. Or, you know, if you like tequila, you can thank a bat for that. Um, 
So again, reminding people about some of these things that you've learned, even if people don't like them, you don't have to love them, but at least realize that they're important for the environment and that they have an impact on you. And of course, another thing you can do is um, become involved with bat conservation groups. Uh, so I will try to take some questions. I know I went a little bit longer. Um, this is a picture from the Raven Stadium in downtown Baltimore. Um, a photographer for the Baltimore Sun shared this photo with me and he found uh, two red bats had fallen out of the sky and landed in the middle of a football game there. So bats are everywhere in the city. And um, I will leave it up on this screen that has uh, a lot of resources. Um, uh, Batweek.org has information about different types of plants that you can plant that'll support insects, that'll support bats. Uh, Bat Conservation International is a wonderful resource. Um, they have a lot of information on there as well as for bat houses um, and some other inform informative sites. So I'll go ahead and stop there and hopefully I have time for a question or two. Absolutely, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, can we can we come back together and so that we can do questions um, as a group? Oh, can y'all hear me? Beth? Oh, can we go? Can you stop share? We can all come back together. Oh, sure. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I didn't make myself clear. <laughs> That's I'll right. just put a um, I'll put a uh, a spotlight on you right there, and and then um, let's see. Thank you, everybody. Saying thank you, thank you, thank you. Great presentation. Um, if you have a question, you can raise your hand um, and then unmute and ask the question. I'm trying to go back. There were a lot of questions in the chat box, some of which you covered. Um, are there bat, is, are there any bat conservation groups in Maryland? Uh, there is one group that is, I think, based out of DC. They're called Save Lucy. Um, so they're semi-local. Um, I don't know if there are any other groups in Maryland, but as I mentioned before, Lights Out Baltimore, um, even though they primarily focus on birds, they also uh, do support bats. And we have a couple of questions. Well, one was, do they eat the cicadas? And I then was two, <laughs> yeah, and then um, do they eat shield bugs that have infested the US? I guess that's the stink bugs, the invasive oh. ones. I think they eat stink bugs. I'm not sure though. Um, I feel like I read somewhere that they eat beetles that are in that family or that group. So it's certainly possible that they eat stink bugs. Um, in terms of cicadas, I imagine it would depend on the species. So I mentioned like the hoary bats are very big. The big brown bats are also pretty big. Um, I imagine that they could possibly catch one and maybe nibble on it. I feel like some of the smaller species might struggle with that a little bit, but it also does depend on how different bat species catch them. So some of them will grab it with their mouth, some of them kind of scoop it up with their feet, and then they'll fly to a branch or something like that, and then they'll sit down and eat it. And some will just fly around and basically open their mouths, grab something, and just keep going. So um, mm. if I had to guess, I would say maybe some of the bigger species might try to eat them. Maybe the red bats too. Um, mm -hmm. And Jeff, was, when you put up there that they have multiple um, pups, how in the world would a bat pregnant with five babies fly and feed? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, for and do they, they don't, I mean, do the babies just stay, stay on the tree while the mom goes no. out and feeds and then they come back? And... Sometimes, yeah. I know with um, some of the species that I've studied, um, they will leave the babies like in the roost and then they'll go out and forage and come back. Um, I think it depends on the species. So some of them definitely will carry their young. I don't know. I think the red bats and the hoary bats will carry them, but I'm not sure how they would do that with five or <laughs> five of them. But I feel like I've seen pictures of them with like one or two kind of like nestled like right under their wings and flying oh. around. So, little super Very cool. <laughs> Yep. And Dave said that he had rescued a red eastern red bat that had been um, chased by a blue jay. 
Oh. You wanted to know if that was just, was that just harassment or do jays prey upon bats for, for a meal? Blue jays will do that. I've heard several stories about um, every so often birds that have a very keen eye can spot them and will harass them and kind of peck at them. So blue jays can definitely be a predator for um, red bats. Um, uh, Nara and Time wanted to know that if you if you are seeing bats in your neighborhood, what's the most what you know? If you had to take a guess, what's the most common one that's out there that you think it would be? Uh, if I had to guess, probably the big brown bats, since they're just like everywhere it seems like. So that would be my first guess. Um, as I mentioned before, if you see them kind of in late afternoon, early evening, while there's still light outside, that could be a red bat. And normally with those, because there is some light, you can kind of see the rusty red coloration on them as they're flying around. So those would be my top two guesses. And Nick is, wants to know what's the latest on the white nose um, uh, syndrome. Uh, syndrome, sorry. And um, are some of them surviving? Are they evolved, getting a, a, an immunity to it? Are we going to see a, a change on that? Yeah, so there's been several. Um, and I just actually had a chance to watch a webinar through um, a lot of folks in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service have been doing some great work with that. Um, and there's basically a lot of different fronts that they're um, working on. And so there has been documented uh, resistance in individuals, which is good. Um, and folks are just trying lots of different options. I, when I was at Missouri, I helped with one project where they were taking bats that were sick in these Missouri caves and they were treating them with uh, some sort of gaseous compound that is Ooh. produced by bacteria that acts as a fungicide. And so um, my, one of my professors would collect these bats when they, were, they had the disease on them. Um, they actually had like little refrigerator kind of things that we would store them in since they're hibernating and they were exposed to this. And then we would monitor them during the winter. Um, and the disease gradually went away from them and I actually got to help release some of them um, kind of at the beginning of summer um, back at one of the caves where they came from. So that was very cool. Um, cool. So treatments, um, there's even vaccines that have been created. Um, wow. artificial roofs where the bats can come in and hibernate there. And then when they leave, they can get kind of cleaned off with some sort of antifungal compound. So um, at least in those artificial roofs, you can do that because it won't affect any other organisms because it's just basically a bunker or something like that for bats. So lots of different, um, lots of different research and programs that have been going on. So it is encouraging. That's good to that's good to hear that if there's a it's a encouraging that there's hope because <laughs> it's kind of it was kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, and Alexa says they have an owl box. Can they also have a bat box? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it would just depend on the placement of them. Um, obviously, not facing the owl box, so when the owl comes out, it can see the bats emerging, maybe. <laughs> Um, but actually the other day when I was, um, I was out at Leakin Park in the evening and I was um, in a patch of trees and there was a barred owl in one of the trees right above me, but then kind of at the same eye level as me was some sort of small bat and it was like foraging basically right below the tree, um, below the owl. So I'm not sure if that was because it knew the owl was there and it was trying to forage lower away from it or if it just didn't care and it was foraging. Um, regardless, so. Um, Emily says uh, more about eating insects. Do they eat the spotted lantern flies? I'm trying to get rid of all the invasives. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if I've seen any information on that, but given that they are an invasive species, I imagine that the bats here aren't very familiar with them. So that would be interesting. I'll have to, I'll have to look that up. Okay. Good. Um, where in Leakin Park is one most likely to view bat activity? That's a good question. So I, I live not far from Leakin Park and actually my family's been very involved with uh, volunteering in there. So I spend a lot of time there. Um, my personal favorite place to look for them there is along Eagle Drive. And there's a gazebo, the nature art space is kind of there. 
Um, the labyrinth, which is what my family manages, is not far away. And that's actually mm -hmm. where I did um, my recordings, where you saw that uh, bar graph and you saw like the really high number. All those calls came from just two 30 minute sessions of recording bats at Leakin wow. Park. I think it was like I had that little detector and it was just constant, nonstop beeps and boops and just so much activity um, right in that area. So. And we have a couple of people who are interested in getting your your email. Um, I don't know if you wanted to share that with folks in the chat box. Yeah, and if you wanted okay. to say what what you're working on on now, um, sure. and the, uh, give us kind of a, an update. Sure. So I'm the new urban wildlife biologist at Masonville Cove Urban Wildlife Refuge Partnership, which is a mouthful. <laughs> um, but again, it's a partnership. So uh, Fish and Wildlife works there, um, Maryland Port Administration, Living Classrooms Foundation, and the National Aquarium. And we all kind of work on different aspects uh, in and around Masonville. And so there's a wildlife management plan set up there. So I help um, do some of that wildlife management. And that includes <clears throat> um, trail camera surveys for documenting wildlife there. I was very excited. The, I think I started in January and the second day I was helping with those and we documented a pair of coyotes um, hanging wow. out in Masonville and apparently they had not been there that much in the past. So it'll be interesting. Um, in June, I'll be doing that again. It'll be interesting to see if they have some little coyotes uh, <laughs> hanging out with them, which I'm looking forward to. Um, so yeah, wildlife research is a big component. Also outreach is another big component for me. So doing presentations like this, um, working on programs at Masonville Cove. I also work part-time uh, with Patuxent Research Refuge down the road, which is also part of Fish and Wildlife. And I help their visitor services team with programming there as well. So it's been a very enjoyable uh, mix of different programs. I have wildlife stuff. I have a plant project to um, grow a special type of plant called Baptisia. So it's uh, false or wild blue indigo and it's used by a threatened species of butterfly called the frosted elfin and so to help with that conservation i'm actually growing a bunch of those plants at masonville and eventually we'll plant them at a preserve on the eastern shore um, where there's a population of these threatened butterflies so I'm, I'm really excited that i get to try lots of different things so there's mammal stuff um, of course there's bird stuff we monitor the eagles that live at Masonville, um, and also I'm working on bird program, pro, uh, bird programming as well. So I'm very excited about um, having lots of different projects that I can kind of dip my toes into, and then also do outreach. Well, it seems like uh, you're very busy, but it seems like you <laughs> love what you do, and we're glad that you are here doing what you're doing, um, and I think that you'll probably be getting some emails from the folks that are on here, uh, because Bill even wants you to act as a docent on a Leakin Park bat tour, so that sounds, <laughs> that sounds fun. Um, yep, and... Uh, any other questions for this evening? And I know that you, you, you're, you're friends with uh, Linda and Charlie at the Natural History Society of Maryland. I'm sure that you've been to our facility in Overly. Um, I was going to ask Steve Sheffield, who is our mammal curator, if we, what, I know that mammals are our least amount of collections that we have down in the basement, but I don't know if you even um, asked about if we had uh, any bat, co bat, co bat specimens from Baltimore, Maryland area from back in the day either. Um, so I, did, did y'all do it? Did you look at the collections? I, I talked to Charlie about it and I feel mm -hmm. like he said that there weren't that many from the city. I actually found a documentation of um, a specimen that's at the Smithsonian that was collected from North Baltimore. And I think that was a Northern long-eared bat, but that was back in the forties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is, this is Adrian. Um, I'm going to interrupt. We have some material from the Cumberland bone cave, okay. which are, uh, I, I'm almost certain are bat remains, bat jaws, bat this, that, and the other. Nice. That would be maybe interesting for you to look at. Sure, yeah. So we'll have to get together. 
When you said you were at Mason, I think you said Mason Cove. Mason Masonville. Yeah, I just put the um, website for Masonville Cove in the um, in the chat. So it's a very big birding hotspot. I feel like every day I see folks down here with their cameras and their scopes to check out the eagles and okay. the dozens of other birds that we have here. What so. what county is it in? <laughs> it's in Baltimore City, it's technically. City. It's, um, <laughs> it's down by the Hanover Street Bridge, not too far away. It's in oh, an industrial oh. area, so it kind of throws you off when you get there, and you're like, "Why is there? Why is there a park here?" Um, but is yeah, that the, is that Middle Branch Park? No, uh, no, it's down the road from Middle Branch. If you know where Frank First Avenue is, or kind of where 895 is, right before it goes right, the water, okay. You can see Masonville from that 895 bridge before it goes underwater. So it's kind of near there. Got it. Yep. Yeah, it's a very special place. And Adrian is um, one of our fossil curators. Uh, so he's uh, talk, talk about that. We have a do have, also have a fossil club. So um, uh, if you haven't been to Masonville Cove, like I said, definitely put it on your put it on your list to, to go visit. It's a very special place. Yeah, Especially, you know, again, if you don't know, you, you're, it's amazing, right? In the middle of the city, and there it is. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions? I'm looking. I don't see any other hands up, but I do see that people look a lot smarter than they did <laughs> when we started, if I'm looking around the room. So, uh, Dr. Carpenter, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise and passion with us. Um, we hope that we get to work and learn with you in the future and see you um, in person in the future. I'm going to go look up when Bat Week is because maybe we could do something at the uh, Natural History Society about bats for Bat Week, which would be fun. Um, well, yeah, and definitely feel free um, if you see me at Masonville Cove to say hi. I'll definitely have, uh, we have a lot of programs coming up this summer, so I'll definitely be at some of them helping out. So please stop by and say hi. <laughs> we will. And uh, remember to buy your raffle tickets to support Natural History Society and your cicada gear. It's only here once every 17 years. So you got to get your cicada gear now uh, before it's gone, before they're gone. So thank you all. Uh, stay safe. Stay curious and stay outside, everybody. We'll see you uh, very soon uh, online and in person. Don't forget World Turtle Day is Sunday. Few tickets are left. Few tickets are left. Come see us. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening, uh, everybody. Thanks. That was a great talk. Thank you. <laughs>